Thank you for joining us today. My name is Barrett Louie, part of the marketing team here at Risk IQ. Today we'll be exploring methodologies for threat analysis, walking through use cases, and working through hands-on exercises. Before we get started, there are a couple housekeeping notes. First, today's workshop is being recorded. Second, today's session will be interactive. Throughout the workshop, we'll be unmuting lines for questions and conversation. If you have questions while your line is muted, please send them through the GoToWebinar control panel and we'll answer as many as we can as we go. Now, let me introduce you to today's team that's here to support you. First, Benjamin Powell. Benjamin is Risk IQ's Director of Technical Marketing and will be leading today's workshop with Alexandra Monk. Alexandra is Risk IQ's Passive Total Solutions Architect. She's responsible for running POCs on Passive Total, demonstrations uh, to prospects, onboarding, training new customers, as well as existing customers. In addition, we have Jacqueline Blumenfeld, who is our Director of Strategic Advisement here to help answer any questions as we go. And with that, I'll hand it over to Benjamin. Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. Um, we're going to um, go through and make sure that everybody on this um, workshop um, gets hands-on experience with Passive Total and understands every single data set that we have and why they're important and how they're used uh, in your investigation. So we're going to be focusing on um, showing you examples for every single data set, um, answering questions. So please, at any point, if you have questions, um, please stop us, You know, type in a question. And if it's a good question that we can answer live, we will um, unmute your mic or um, Jacqueline will, will um, take your question and, and, and ask us and we'll respond to it immediately. So we want to make this uh, interactive. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to turn this over to Alexandra so she can go through and uh, kick us off. Perfect. Thanks so much, Benjamin. So just to start off with, I wanted to make sure that everyone understands the basics of the different types of license offering that we have. So if you have a community account using a free domain that would fall under the community column. So for instance, if you used gmail.com for your account. So as you can see, there's some differences in the breakdown overall. Um, using a community account, you're going to have 14 days of resolution history uh, for PDNS, as well as 14 days of history for our certificates and hashes. If you have a corporate domain, but still a free license, that would fall under security professional. So what you get with that is a little bit more information. Um, so 90 days of PDNS resolutions, 90 days of certificates as well as hashes. But you also get access to our or services data set, which we'll talk more about here in a bit. Um, and then, of course, as an enterprise user or if you have the enterprise trial, which you're eligible for the enterprise trial for 30 days if you use a corporate domain. Um, so that's enabled automatically once you register or once you log in for the first time uh, since we did our release of the new Passive Total platform with our threat intelligence portal as of August 5th. So what you get with enterprise is unlimited history for all of our data sets. Um, as well as all the different types of features that we have. Um, so we'll we'll talk more about those uh, differences in the coming slides. Alex, can I mention something real quick? Yeah. So the reason why um, we have the two different free accounts is that um, with the free Gmail or, or Yahoo Mail, we can't really tell what organization you belong to, if you're good or bad. We don't know. Um, so with the security professional, it's linked to an organization. So we know that you're from a real company. And that's why we're giving you the services, because if you can find out every place in the world a particular um, application was running or port that was open, you could potentially use that for bad. So we want to make sure that we're really having you vetted. So by using your organizational email, we really make sure that you're, um, you're really a security professional and you're going to be using this for your organization. And then the, the, um, we have a promo code for everybody today. At the very bottom of the screen on every single slide, um, you're going to see that. Uh, and it's VRTHW-101. And we'll get into that, how to put it in or how to create your account in just a minute. But I wanted to, to explain, we didn't used to give out the services information, but we're doing that because you've been um, vetted that you're really a, a security professional. Okay, thanks, Alex. 
Thanks, Benjamin. And the other thing that I'd like to add to just on that note is if you already had an existing free domain, but you've got public projects created, tags, things like that, just let us know if you're interested in moving over to a security professional license. And we've got ways on the back end that we can migrate all of your projects and other types of personalizations that you did, adding tags, classifications, things like that. We can move that over to the corporate account so that it's not um, a lot of work on your end. So just reach out to us directly afterwards and we can get that set up for you. So this next slide kind of gives a breakdown as far as the level of data that you have with the different types of accounts. So where it says individual account, that's just aka the community license organization account, aka the security professional license that we just talked about. So just from a visual perspective, you can see like under the organization account, there's malware. So maybe that malware hash came, um, you know, back like the beyond 14 days. So you wouldn't have access to that information on the individual account. And then if you look over to the enterprise account, you can see things like blacklisted IP, blacklisted domain, which is a representation of our analyst insights, which is an enterprise only feature. And then if you take a look over at the threat actor infrastructure, that might be um, a data point, an indicator that we provided under our risk IQ indicators, part of our article, our threat intel articles, which we'll talk more about in a bit. So this is just a good visual for the additional information that you're gonna get out of having an enterprise account. And so just kind of talking through some of the data sets, uh, we have two different types of data sets, right? We've got our traditional data sets, your who is PDNS, so all of the resolution history that we've captured over the last 11 years, our certificates, subdomains, OSINT, which is short for open source intelligence, as well as hashes, services, and projects. So we'll talk more about what all of those are in the coming slides. And then um, as an enterprise user, again, you get access to our advanced data sets, things like trackers, components, host pairs, and cookies, which are all gleaned from our virtual users, our web crawlers, which again, we'll talk more about in a bit, what how those are executed and how we're able to grab all the content from the internet via those crawls and bring those back. Um, but it's really, really helpful being able to lean on those sorts of data sets uh, when maybe the who is record, the latest who is record is redacted for privacy. And so you don't have any good contact information to pivot off of to find other domains that share the same contact information in their who is records. So you can leverage things like trackers or cookies um, to find different threat actors that are clearly trying to impersonate an organization. And we'll talk more about how that all works here in a bit. Um, or you could leverage host pairs, which are just dependent requests that we observe on the page to <clears throat> see how the domain that you're searching for has a parent host that's interacting with a child host name. So you can see those relationships as well to just broaden your investigation. So this just gives kind of another overview as far as the breakdown in data sets by free accounts, just a different visual from what we talked about before. Again, as a community user, you're only going to get 14 days of history for our PDNS, SSL, as well as hash information. Um, and then as a security professional with an organizational license, corporate domain, you're going to have access to 90 days of history as well as the services as Benjamin and I just talked about. And so again, this just kind of gives an overview of the enterprise and trial accounts, all of the information that you get access to. So I kind of talked about it before, but just wanted to give an example about why our advanced data sets are so important for customers. So we'll talk about this a little bit more coming up, but just one example is let's say um, we were able to glean a tracker value, which are just unique codes or values that track user activity back to a single entity. So it's very common um, in social media IDs or SEO IDs, where if you're able to go then and pivot off of a tracker value, you could see if that um, organization that has that tracker, right, has other foreign domains that also have that same tracker value, which would be an indication that they probably had some sort of bot that scraped the source code from the domain that you're searching against and never stripped out that tracker value. So that's a really, really good way to go and see if threat actors are out there trying to impersonate your brand 
or leverage the source code for different types of phishing attacks. So we'll see more of that, but that's just one really good example of why our advanced data sets are so helpful, um, especially when you've got who is records that are redacted for privacy. Benjamin, I don't know if you want to add anything else. Yeah, so the, 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 the most important thing to understand is that the advanced data sets are, are um, unique to Risk IQ because we actually go out and gather this data. And when we bring that information back in, we're able to pull these pieces out and link it all together. So when something gets, like you pull an image from, from Facebook and you're sending data out to Google Analytics, we see every relationship with everything in the world, the entire IP4 space. So by understanding those relationships, we're able to figure out from a single uh, IOC or indicator, everything else that's related to it. Um, and so even with redaction, with privacy and things like that, you will be able to link that infrastructure together and chain it together to get the entire attack and understand everything that you have to um, deal with. Perfect, thanks Benjamin. All right, so Benjamin talked about this earlier, but we do have that seven day promo code. So this will give users that have a free domain like gmail.com enterprise access for seven days. Um, otherwise, for those of you that are interested that have never registered, let's say for a passive total account before, you can go ahead and register for a 30 day enterprise trial using your corporate account. Um, <clears throat> and then you won't need that actual promo code. So for those of you that do have a uh, an ex already existing free email domain. Um, the coming slides here are going to give you screenshots on how to go about um, entering that into your account settings of passive total. So the first thing that you'll want to do is go and uh, again, for those of you that don't have an account, go and register for your account. Otherwise, you'll want to log into passive total and enter in the virtual threat hunting um, workshop promo code. So You'll do that from your person icon in the upper right hand corner, and that's where you can come in and, and plug that that uh, that code right below. Yeah, and it's case sensitive, so please make sure you type it correctly. And once you type it in and you click out of that location, you automatically see your numbers pop up tremendously. So this will you'll give you API access and full access to all the data sets for seven days if you are not in a current trial. Um, and every time we do a workshop, we'll give you a, a promo code so you can um, really use the product to its fullest uh, during the workshop, but then also afterwards. Perfect, thanks Benjamin. You're welcome. All right, and so these are some of the different tools that we're gonna be leveraging today. So I would ask all of you to go ahead and save all of these in your browser. I know, um, Benjamin, were you planning to add those to the chat? I just did. So they're in the chat right now, so you don't have to type them. But the the, the applications that we're gonna be using is Risk IQ Passive Total. We have Google Safe Browsing Check to make sure a website's good or bad. URL Scan IO, just in case we wanna look at an image, and hybrid analysis. But one thing to remember, the system that we're using is a live system. And so with that, what we're going to be investigating are real live attacks and real bad things. So you don't want to go there directly. You want to keep a buffer between you and the threat. So we're going to be using tools that can go out and gather the data and bring it back in uh, to protect you and your organization. Okay. So remember, everything that we're doing is live and it's real. It's not made up. Um, so as we go through and do investigations, these are live, real, bad things that we're going to be investigating. Perfect. Thanks, Benjamin. You're welcome. So I'll tell you about myself. I'm Benjamin Powell, the Director of Technical Marketing here at Risk IQ. Uh, over the last 30 years, I've either managed uh, network and security operations in companies, uh, state government, um, San Diego International Airport, Port of San Diego, uh, working in education, biotech companies, startups, financial services, manufacturing, and then for probably the last um, 13, 14 years have been working, um, developing uh, security products for all different um, organizations around the world. Now, fun fact, uh, I am into spear fishing. You can probably see on my wall some of my spear guns. But when I tell people in our industry that I'm a spear fisherman, they don't want to take my emails anymore. So you can, you can 
uh, if you want to link to me on, on uh, LinkedIn, um, you can. Uh, we do um, different types of workshops all the time. Um, we even do them for organizations and for groups as well. We really want to give back to the community and teach you how to fish or how to find these bad people uh, to make your life easier. So then when a threat comes up, you've already experienced what you need to do and you're not learning on the job during a, an attack. And I'll turn this back over to Alex. Perfect, thanks Benjamin. Now I'm gonna talk a little bit about myself. So I'm a Passive Total Solutions Architect here at Risk IQ. Don't have quite as much experience in cybersecurity as Benjamin does, but I started my career in sales and technical recruiting. Um, my major minor back in college when I graduated was marketing and then I minored in computer science. So realized I wanted to get into something more technical uh, moving forward. So I had the opportunity to kind of switch gears and um, go more on the IT training route and then later became an integration architect for Cerner, and then I came over to Risk IQ back in April. So learning a lot about cybersecurity, um, knew that the, as the IoT was expanding um, and more and more domains were coming up, cybersecurity was only going to continue to grow. So it's been it's been great so far. I've definitely learned a lot along the way, and I'm excited to educate you all in the coming investigations. So that's about me. Fun fact: um, I've actually lived in four out of seven different countries continents, the fourth being the U.S. actually, where I was raised in Wisconsin. My dad had a great job um, back in the late 80s, early 90s, and got to live overseas uh, with my mom for a few different years. So, um, so yeah, that's a little bit about me. All right, so we wanted to also provide you all with some hands-on training that you can exercise after uh, the presentation today. For those of you that this is the first webinar you're sitting on, there's probably going to be a lot that you're going to learn in one full swoop that's a lot to consume and absorb. So we wanted to make sure that we provided some hands-on threat hunting exercises so you can actually put what you've learned today into practice to better enable you to understand how you can leverage all of our different data sets. So we, I'd encourage you to go ahead and, and check that out at your leisure um, <clears throat> as you have time after the presentation. Yeah, so generally what we like to do is that that resource page when we come up with new use cases we update that site all the time so then you can always go back and learn uh, new techniques uh, new data sets uh, new uh, indicators and, and new um, tactics and uh, techniques that that the threat actor might be doing so it's a really good way to train your eye to know what is something good and something that's bad and i've also threw that in the chat as well so this link is not indexed from Google, so you have to know it to get to it. So it's listed right here for you. Perfect, thanks Benjamin. You're welcome. All right, Barrett, do you wanna ask some poll questions before we begin? Yeah, absolutely. Let me get the first one fired up. And the reason why we ask these poll questions is we wanna find out the jobs that you do and your level of understanding of risk IQ and, and threat hunting. Um, so then we can cater our uh, the way that we're going to present to match the audience. So this is why we ask the questions. So the first question, what type of passive total account are you using? Are you using the free email account, the corporate email account, or the paid account? And the reason why we're asking is we want to make sure that you understand what you're seeing today and what you might see a week from now or two weeks from now uh, if your trial is over or the, the code is no longer working. Okay, so about 93% of you have a corporate email account. That's awesome. About 7% are on an enterprise uh, paid account. Okay, great. Okay, and what area of the organization that you um, work in? And the reason for this is that um, if you're vulnerability management, we'll focus a little bit more on the type of web components and um, ports and services. If you're an incident responder, uh, the, we will show you some techniques to look at yourself and, and find bad things that might be going against you, things like that. Okay, so we have about um, threat analysts, the, the, the biggest one, SOC people, uh, incident responders, vulnerability and pen testers. So with the pen testers, the services piece will be really nice for you to, to take a look at. So when you look at an IP address, you'll be able to see 
uh, for the last 14 days, the ports and services and banners um, that are active. Very cool. So are you using the community free or enterprise paid? We did this one already, I think. Okay. And we every time that we do these workshops online, we try to make the content unique, completely new. So we like to find out the type of thing you might want to see. So for a future one, we can try to get those use cases ready to be able to show you how to do them. So we have uh, we can do skimmers like with Magecart, phishing, malware, social media impersonation, investigating mobile applications, things like that. Okay, so we the biggest one is uh, phishing, um, malware, and then it's split between social media impersonation and mobile applications. Okay, great. Okay, have you used uh, Risk IQ advanced data sets before? Um, the host pairs, cookies, components, trackers, services, or SSL certs? Okay, about 69% no. So this, you're gonna love this course that we put together today because we're gonna go through every data set. So you're gonna know about all the advanced data sets and how to use them and the questions you should be thinking about um, and the answers that you, you should be looking for when you use them. So, great. And that concludes our poll questions. Awesome. Okay, Alex. Oh, I am showing my screen still. Okay. Yes, you are. Yes. Sorry about that. I didn't realize that. Perfect. <laughs> <laughs> Still a little new to this, guys. All right. So I wanted to talk about how we go about actually capturing our derived data set. So really, it, it boils down to our patented virtual user technology. So to avoid detection, RiskIQ's virtual users deploy from hundreds of rotating proxies worldwide, emanating from a combination of residential, commercial, and mobile egress points. So each of these is highly configurable to emulate a wide range of specific human-like behaviors, such as scrolling and clicking. They also imitate popular browsers, devices, applications, and operating systems. For Can example, I... go ahead, go ahead. I thought you were done, go ahead. Sorry. No, no, it's okay. Um, for example, having the ability to simulate a mobile phone browser in the region in which it's being targeted means that the risk IQ call crawlers have a higher likelihood of observing the full exploitation chain. So <clears throat> we're conducting this, you know, on a, a routine basis every day across all of IPv4. Um, so there's a preservation of hosts, first seen, last seen, and metadata. So we're able to capture all of that historical information and then serve it up into passive total. Um, so you can see some of the other data points here. Uh, we egress out of, you know, against 150 different countries, um, and we have a collection of over 220 ports and service banners associated with the host. So Benjamin, anything else you want to add? Yeah, so think of it this way. Anytime that we do uh, an announcement, let's say we find a threat, and we say we found the threat this particular way, what do you think the threat actor does? They change their their method. So think of it this way. If we came from our own data center, um, then the threat actor will know, hey, they're coming from this data center. I'm going to filter out their data. So then I know that anybody coming from this IP range is risk IQ. So I'm just going to filter it out so they won't see me. So then that's why we have to go through proxies. And then they might um, set it up in such a way where the attack is only for a geographic region or a type of device. Um, so that's why we have to we have to imitate those types of things. They might be targeting mobile. They might be targeting residential or corporate IP space. Um, so all of the things that we do and the way that we change is like the threat actor. We'll make an announcement. We'll do something. Uh, we might have to gather data a different way, or we might make a completely new data set. So for cookies, for example, we have the data, but it was not available in the UI. And a couple years ago. After um, 
do an investigation and we looked at it, we said there was a single piece of data that eliminated all the infrastructure. So we rolled back and we created a data set and rolled it forward to get all that information to you so you can use this advanced data set. So everything that we're doing is because a threat actor or somebody uh, was trying to stop us from finding them. And so Alex, go ahead. Perfect. So yeah, everything that Benjamin just kind of talked about hits on this slide. Um, I'll just add on a little bit more. These are you know, no agent virtual users. So um, they simulate human web interactions and the full composition of internet assets. Um, the human web simulation is the most scientific method of absorbing internet intelligence, namely the causes and effects. So by interacting with digital and internet assets, our virtual users can extract every attribute that makes up the asset's behavior, including its edge relational debate behaviors. So, so if you think of it this way, um, we will go out to like Google, we'll do a search, we'll have cookies, we have state, we'll go to a website, we'll present those cookies. We're acting like a real user. And the data that we see is what a real user would see because we act um, like a real user collecting that data. So we pull down the full document object model, we pull out the data, we see the relationships, the dependent requests, all of those things is just like a real user. So that's how, for example, we can find an H cart and other people can't because we act like that real user and we know what happens because we see what detonates on the crawler when we access those places like the user would experience so we act like the intended victim like your parents on the internet um, so we do things um, to make sure that we are um, representing what real people do perfect thanks benjamin You're welcome. All right, so the other way in which we go about collecting our data is through our network of sensors. So we collect data at an unmatched scale. Our systems conduct daily scans of more than 228 unique ports and service banners across the entire IPv4 space to, look, to collect host data, including when it was first and last seen, service banners, and much more. So each day, RiskIQ's network of virtual users makes up uh, billions of HTTP requests and takes in terabytes of passive DNS data, collecting millions of components such as SSL certificates, tracking codes, and cookies. And we're currently mapping 157 billion relationships across the internet. So over the course of the last 11 years of ingesting all of this data, we've collected over five petabytes of internet facing data. So just to give you an idea of the volume of data that we're dealing with, um, we've really done a good job of, of capturing all of that for you, for your so, investigation. So one thing to think about, like the first and last scene, you go, well, who cares about that? But when you, when you think about like when something got infected and when it got cleaned up, we can tell. So if, if somebody put a malicious script someplace or your website is accessing a script that's bad, we can tell you the first time that that, that was seen and then when it was stopped seeing. So that's how we can tell you, oh, we know when they were compromised and we know when they were cleaned up. So that's how we can do it with that first and last scene. So as we go through some of the use cases, you'll be able to, we'll, we'll be able to tell when that happens. So I also wanted to talk about the concept of infrastructure chaining. So our, our web pages are made up of many different remote resources that get assembled to form a co cohesive user experience. So our Risk IQ collection keeps the full HTML of the web page, as Benjamin noted before, saving any dependent file used in its loading process. The DOM, as he mentioned, links, console messages, cookies, headers, independent requests, JavaScript, and other files. So with this information, we can link infrastructure showing the interconnectivity of different entities across the web, ide identifying dependencies and pathways of each asset. So you can kind of see just from looking at this, let's pretend all of these represents a different indicator that falls within our different data sets. So you could start with a piece of malware and then see what IP is associated to it and what SSL certificate is attached to it. Um, and then see what other domains um, you know, are share the same, were observed from an IP that, you know, observed the same SSL certificate, which um, this domain was resolving to this IP. 
And then maybe this domain had a tracker that linked us to other domains. So you can kind of just from this visual get an idea of how you can take all of the data sets that we have with all the history and everything within one platform and be able to quickly pivot and build an entire um, chain of the entire threat. So Benjamin, anything you want to add to that? Yeah, so we, we, we've trademarked infrastructure chaining. So from the single indicator that you find or you have, we can show you all the relationships that that indicator has with everything else in the world and map it out and show you the complete full infrastructure of that threat actor. And, and from that single piece of malware, that's the layer one, you, we can then tell you immediately, oh, that's on this IP and there's this certificate associated with it. And then from examining the certificate uh, organizational information, for example, we can see the domain it's associated with and then other IPs that are associated with that domain and build out the entire infrastructure chain. Yeah. So this slide just kind of goes through um, how we've recently launched our threat intelligence portal as of August 5th. So here you can see this is a screenshot of the indicators that were included in one of the articles. And we'll talk more about um, just the functionality behind the threat intelligence portal in the coming slides. But we're essentially, here's like that map of all of the indicators that were included in the article from an infrastructure chaining perspective. And here's a screenshot of the community public indicators that were available in the um, in the article that we surfaced. And all of these are pivotable directly into Passive Total or our third party sources like Virus Total, et cetera. So it's a time savings that we're providing to be able to go out and scrape those indicators and then serve them up in our threat intel or par intel portal so that you don't have to sit there and plug them in one by one um, and search them up into passive total directly. So when you think of it this way, when we, we have about 90,000 community users. When we talk to the community users to find out how they're really using passive total and what they're doing in their daily lives, what we found out is they start off with an article some open source piece of threat intel that came in. And the first thing that they do is they say, well, I put it into passive total to find out if it's related, if it's bigger than what that was published, or if we have any connections to it somehow. So what, what we've done is we've taken that, those open source articles that are out there on the internet uh, that come out all the time, and we have a threat intel person that has gone through and we've taken out all those indicators that might be in a screenshot, might be in a picture, um, and we've made them that they're they're downloadable and clickable. So instead of having to type them, you can just click on them and see what's happening. So with community accounts, you have access to all the community indicators. Um, so all of the open source indicators are published, but you don't have to type them. But as we start looking at this, we had our threat intel people add more information in there to tell you more things about the threats. And we've taken this information and we made it even expanded it to give you additional artifacts. So when you expand it out, Alex, you can go, you can talk more about this or go to the, the next slide. Yeah. So if you, if you start the slide, so from those initial indicators, because of the infrastructure chaining that we do, we can tell you the full picture. So when you open up that article to actually do something with it, you get everything. So you're starting off further down the road than if you just had that article and you had to do the investigation yourself. So you save about two hours uh, a day by having this already done for you and then immediately knowing what you need to do to take action. Thanks, so this just kind of gives you a visual again of being able to look at the community indicators that we provide, but then also seeing how our threat intel team has provided additional indicators to broaden that investigation. So um, as an enterprise user, you get those additional risk IQ indicators, but, but as a corporate um, community user or free domain user, you're only gonna have access to those community indicators that are provided from the article. So Benjamin, you wanna talk about this slide? Sure. So when we take a look about looking at all the data that we've collected and we put together, um, we have the ability to go back in time and see all this information. So the rich history that we have, when something is, is deemed to be bad, we can go back in time and say, you know, now are there anything else associated with it suspicious or bad? We're able to link all these facets together from 
certificates, from IP addresses, domains, open source intelligence, the host pairs, to give you the full thing of, of, of what has changed and how it is now. So you can see how the internet is changing over time and how this threat has either grown or shrunk or the vulnerabilities that you now have that time has progressed. Perfect. Thanks, Benjamin. Okay. So this next slide just kind of talks through just the volume of data that we've collected over time. I mentioned before that since we were founded, we've captured over five petabytes of data, but from a daily perspective, we're, um, we're observing 250,000 new domains um, that are resolving to IPs per day. We're also seeing 5.5 million new hosts um, that are resolving to IPs on a daily basis. And we're seeing over 106 billion total unique DNS records as well. So this just gives you an idea of the full amount of data that we're dealing, that we're dealing with on a daily basis. Benjamin, I'll let you drive these next slides. Sure, so when you think about all the data that we're bringing in, um, it goes through a process. So we go out and we collect this data and the way that we determine what we're going to collect and how we do it, so our security researchers and threat intel people might say, hey, this is a, a, a certain type of tracker or a certain thing that we're looking for and when we crawl the data, this is what we're looking for. The data scientists take that and they create machine learning algorithms to go out and use the crawlers to gather this data and bring it in. So this might be the response body, a JavaScript file, certificates, the banners, the client-side DOM, uh, the DNS records. And as that comes in, we cut it up and we put those into our data sets. Um, and that allows us then to create some derived data sets like our blacklist, like Google and Microsoft will take our blacklist and put it into production within about 10 minutes. So if a customer of ours says, hey, this is a domain infringement or a phishing attack against my organization, they confirm it, it immediately goes on our blacklist and then 95% of the world's browsers won't go there uh, within 10 to 15 minutes. And then it takes about one to four days to take it down off the internet. But we have phishing lists, zero day lists, accomplice lists, that means like you might be uh, connecting to something that might be bad, uh, malicious, for example. Um, we have we track scams and uh, spam, and um, we give reputation um, uh, lists for all of the things on the internet. Um, so we do this in such a way to make it that when you go through and start your investigation, you don't have to massage the data. It's already there, ready to go for you to, to get the ground, hit the ground and, and keep on going. Uh, can you get to the next slide? So one cool thing about what we do is, I mentioned this before, like we did an investigation with Turla where they were using satellites, the Russians were using satellites to bring um, stolen data um, out of organizations and they would send it to a legitimate IP address that was over satellite. And then they would just set up a satellite receiver and receive that data and collect it. Um, but with, a, with a, um, a single cookie, we were able to eliminate all the infrastructure that was um, compromised and part of this attack uh, to find it. So uh, if you if you hit the next, hit next. So you really need to have a time machine to be able to create this stuff, but because we have this rich history, we're able to do that. So we actually have the ability to do that. So go to the next slide and hit one more time. So if we looked at, for example, um, a particular type of cookie value, and if it was encrypted, we can take the data that was from yesterday and the data that we collected today and we do a merge every day. So next slide. And when we do this merge, we're able to then pull that piece of data out or create that new um, um, value, those IOCs. And then what that allows us to do is to create a new aggregate and that's what the platform uses. So we can go back and roll a data set from the beginning of time that we collected to present. No one else can do that. Um, so if there was a problem with a, a, a formatting with a data, we can go back and correct that. Or if there's a completely new element that we're going to track and understand, we can roll that forward. It's not from this point forward like a traditional like SIM, you create the rule and only when it triggers or only from this point forward, we can go back in time and bring that forward. So it's very unique in the industry. So the, the cool thing about this is that 
this allows you to really think about what could, should, would, and is happening and did happen in your organization. So if you can um, hit the next piece. So this is your security posture, your controls and policies, your modeling, uh, your monitoring, and your security investigations. And, and the Risk IQ platform allows you to do this. Um, can you go to the next slide? So um, with the cyber kill chain, the thing that you need to think about is the earlier you can detect something and stop it, um, the less risk the organization and the least amount of cost. So if you can find out something that's happening during a planning stage and stop it, or during the recon, the setup, or the weaponization, uh, prior to it getting into your organization, um, you don't you, you're you're in a lot better shape. But most organizations put their money where they have control and visibility, and that's from the firewall in. And so where Risk IQ focuses is everything outside the firewall. So we're like a sim on the internet. We see all this data, we collect it, we understand it, and we can have you use that information into your internal systems to make them um, smarter and faster so you understand what's happening. Um, so it's really important to get earlier in that, that kill chain. So when you think about like during an attack, there might be discussions on the deep and dark web. Um, and then there might be a domain that gets registered. And then they park the domain. And it might have been a typo squatted domain. But then it gets email capable or they have your logos on there. So now this is where that site is getting ready for the attack. So we can usually find things about one to four days before they're active. So if you can stop something before it takes effect uh, and, and block it or shut it down, you can prevent that from affecting your users or your customers. And if you go to the next slide, we can continue to monitor it. So once you take it down or you stop it, it's like whack-a-mole, it can happen again. So we can continue to monitor it and with those infrastructure chaining that we do and to be able to link that information across we're able to figure out if it gets someplace else what's happening and so as it comes back up we're able to see it and stop it again um, very quickly before it can take effect so once we understand your organization for example anything that looks like your organization or refers to things from your organization is suspect and so we're able to immediately find that and we have a pattern for that it's called the minhash algorithm so we like we hash the full document object model and compare it with every other document object model in the world on all the, the domains. Can you go to the so so the cool thing about this is that we all play on the same battlefield. And because we're on the same battlefield, um, we um, can collect information and understand what's happening if we can see those signals. So like in your organization, if you um, have logging turned on and you're doing different things to collect that data, then when something happens, you have the telemetry, you have that information to go back and figure out what happened and, and uh, who they touched and what occurred. And the same thing gets happened with us. So if you look at a threat, so like let's go through a, a typical threat. So if you have a threat actor and you have a targeted user, um, and let's say the person, the threat actor is in Brazil and they're attacking somebody in Canada. For just them to get on the internet, there's some signals that are, are out there. So for example, there's an IP address, a network block, uh, the autonomous system number, uh, their internet service provider. And then when they create the phishing email, um, there will be an email provider, a subject, a message body, a language, uh, a date and timestamp. And the next one. So then when the message gets sent, it has to tra travel through network. So we can see the transit times and addresses. Um, the network blocks and things like that. And then it gets to the user, uh, next slide. And when it gets to the user, it might be HTML email where it might link back to infrastructure controlled by the threat actor to fingerprint the user, uh, to find out their operating system, um, what time they read the message um, and things like that. So this is kind of what we're doing. We're gathering all this data, this telemetry. It's like if a tree falls in the wood, does it in the woods, does it make a noise? And the answer is yes, but only if you're there to collect this data. Um, if you go to the next slide. So these signals that we have are the different data sets that we're going to go through today. So the passive DNS. This is the information about what IP address responded to that, that domain for that particular date and time. The who is record. Who owns that, that record? 
who is it registered to? The certificate, the IP address and domain that's associated with this particular certificate number, the trackers, the little bits of code that track user experience, for example. Um, but also, if you have trackers on your own website, if somebody duplicates your website, they're probably duplicating your trackers, okay? Uh, the host pairs, this is the relationship of what comes in and what goes out of every domain when you, when you view it. From your site or from your computer, your browser goes to a website and it might pull in things from Facebook. It might send things out to Google Analytics. You might pull an image from someplace else. We see all those relationships. The host details associated with it, the cookies that were there, uh, the hashes that were seen on there, the open source intelligence, the document object model, the HTTP headers, the console log messages, the open ports, the exposed services that might be out there. All those are are seen. So with anything, you need to have strong analytical leads or solid analytical leads. Um, and what that means is that by seeing somebody using a certificate from, let's say, Let's Encrypt, a free certificate authority, on its own is not bad. Somebody just might be doing that to save money. It doesn't mean it's, it's fraudulent or it's malicious from that alone. But if you look at it and you go, hey, it's a typo squatted domain. Um, it's using a free certificate authority. Uh, it's email capable. It has my images on there. And it's hosted in a foreign country that I don't do business in. Those could be multiple points of proof to say, hey, that's probably malicious or, or at least suspicious. So we try to say if you have three of those points, you probably have enough information to say if it's good or bad. And so when we go through and we look at stuff, We'll look at some real good sites, and then we're going to look at some bad sites that are attacking them and be able to see what differences you're going to see. And you're going to start training your eyes to be able to know how to determine if something's good and how to determine if something's bad. Uh, next slide. So as we go through, you could be doing these same th sort of things in your own organization, making sure that you're um, collecting the data having NTP turned on on your logging, things like that. So when you try to do your investigations, things uh, line up correctly. And so these are some of the techniques and tactics and procedures we're going to go through and talk about threat actors. We're going to show what they're doing, how, how they're out there, the naming conventions they use, so you can start to understand how to figure out these things on your own. Okay. Uh, next question, the next, next one. So now we're going to talk about data sets. Um, so Next slide. So when we think about data sets, these are the data sets. Go back one, please. So when you think about data sets, these are the things that most of you are familiar with and have used before, because these are commodities that people will buy off other people, but they're not linked together. So on their own, they could be useful, but they're no longer useful because the piece that kind of linked a lot of these things together, the who is data, is no longer working because of GDPR. So you have to use other data sets to give you those, those links to be able to infrastructure chain things together to find the full breadth of the attack. So let's go on to the, the next slide. So, um, so what we're gonna do is we're gonna start going through and looking at um, a domain and we're gonna talk about these um, uh, different things that we're seeing. But what I'd like you to do is I want you to search for passivetotal.org. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take over, Alex, because it's going to be a little bit easier than, than if uh, you're, you're running it right now. Thanks for running the slide so far for me. So I'm going to make myself presenter, and I'm going to show my screen. Let me know when you see my screen. We can see it, Benjamin. OK. So. Uh, I've logged into Passive Total, and there's two different views that you you can see. So if you've used Passive Total before, it probably looked like this, uh, the classic view, this this view right here. But we also have a new view, and the new view is a way for us to search um, for articles, open source things, but also link into some of the data sets. So what we're going to do for right now is I like you to use the classic PT search. And here we're going to look for www.passivetotal.org. OK? 
okay? And I'm gonna search for it and then I'm gonna copy it and I'm going to paste it into the chat to make your life a little bit easier so you can just click on it, okay? And then I'm gonna give you a history lesson. I'm gonna tell you everything about passive total um, just from looking at the data that we have here, okay? So when we first search this, we can see, hey, there was an update three days ago. There's this analyst insights. So what this is, is this is um, um, questions that were analysts would ask to be able to say if something is good or bad or suspicious. Um, and so these were common things that we we're hearing from analysts from around the world that we wanted to pre-populate. So then you could save time and effort by knowing, for example, that, hey, they just added a new subdomain. Uh, it was just placed on a blacklist. Um, it has a, a, cha a change with the who is record. So you can actually see what's occurring here. Now this middle section is the heat map. So most of you, if, if you've done threat intelligence or threat investigations um, for a while, you will, you will find out that um, you don't really um, get told immediately when something happens. So sometimes it's like, okay, I wish you would have told me last week when this was happening because we didn't really have logging turned on and if you would have told me, we could have really done something about it. So with inside of passive total, you have the ability to go back in time and look at stuff. So you have this bar down here that shows you the entire history of everything we've collected. So we can see the first scene was on uh, April 16th, 2014, and the last date was uh, the 8th that we have data for. So this heat map has a little curve on the bottom, a curve on the top. You see these different squares. That represents the end of a month or the beginning of a month. So if I click on one of these squares, okay? So if I come in here, I hover over, it will give me the unique IP addresses that we saw on that day, okay? So if I click in one square, it will filter and just show me those results. If I hold the shift key down and I click on another square, it will now show me for that time range. So I can be very specific. And now the full window of what you see, I'm just gonna go and click on the far, far right side, gives me six months. So there's six months worth of data at one time shown on the screen, okay? And if I click on any other spot in there, it will show me just that six month window of time, okay? So I'm gonna refresh this one more time so I can see all the records. Here we go. So now I'm seeing everything, nothing is filtered, okay? So if I want to now go back in time and see what's happening here, if you notice on the left-hand side, there's some filters and there's a lot of data here. I have 45 records. I can see everything by changing this sort of sending. I'm just gonna make it 500 to see everything possible. And then on the left-hand side, you'll see these checkboxes and Xs. So if I click on the checkbox, that will filter to show me those things. And if I click on it again, it removes it. And if I click on the X, that will remove it from the list. Okay, and if I click again, it takes off the filter. So um, that's how the interface works. That's a quick cra uh, um, crash course to show you that. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna bring up a slide to show you about um, looking at the resolutions. These are the A records. And then things that you should be thinking about. So give me a quick second. It is presenting to my wrong screen, so give me a quick second. Let me try again. Benjamin, would you like me to ask some of those questions? That's yeah, easier. Well, well, if okay. you can, um, yeah. somebody, give me one second. Um, I'm going to stop sharing my screen for a second, and then I'm going to pick a different screen. I have three screens right now running, so it's using my wrong screen, so just one second. So, okay, so now I should be able to present. Okay, can everybody see my slide? Yep. Let's get okay. So when you when you look at this, these A records, so 
some important things to think about. And you're going to get copies of all these slides. We're going to make PDFs and we're going to send them out to you. So this is kind of like a um, good reference material for you. So we're not going to focus too much on slides anymore, but we're just going to briefly show you this, and then we're going to go to the interface and talk about it. So um, the A records are the, um, the resolution. So this is the IP address for that domain in this particular time. Um, what's nice about this is you, you'll be able to determine, hey, is it a dynamic DNS IP? And we don't mark IP addresses as malicious. We mark them as suspicious because if it's a dynamic DNS um, and we marked it as, as being bad and the person released and renewed their IP, they might get a new one. And then a real legitimate domain might be using that IP and they might not be bad. So IPs are, are generally never marked malicious. Uh, they're only suspicious, but a domain could be marked as malicious, okay? Um, we can see when it was registered, um, if it's routable. So you might be thinking, well, you're looking at the internet. Everything has to be routable on the internet. It would never be a 127 address, for example. And the truth is we see those. And you're thinking, well, how would you ever see a non-routable IP address on the internet? Well, when we go talk to the WHOIS um, record, that domain's listed to a DNS server. And that DNS server, if you go to it, will give you all the records of every domain and every IP address associated with it. So the threat actor might say, I'm gonna make this a loopback address, the 127.0.0.1, and stage it. And then I'm gonna do my attack and make it public for a little bit. And then I'm gonna make it back so it's non-routable. But we see that. And so in some of the exercises you're gonna see, you might see a non-routable IP address, then a routable IP address, then back to a non-routable. We're also looking at the AS number, the autonomous system. Is it part of Amazon or is it in China or is it in Italy? Is it in a foreign place that you don't do business with, but it looks like it might be your domain or a customer or a partner that you're using? Um, we're able to look to see, hey, has it ever been compromised? Um, is it sinkhole? Um, are there, um, what, what country is associated with all those types of things. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to now share my other screen. Okay. So now if we go back into here and we take a look for a second, you will notice that if I go to the very bottom um, of this list, okay, we can see stuff going back pretty far in time. So this is back in 2015. And if I go over this ASN number, you'll see it's DigitalOcean. It's also been tagged as Routable and DigitalOcean. So um, Brandon Dixon and Steve Ginty founded Passive Total, and they did this, um, this product because when they would do an investigation, it took them about a week to get all the data together, normalize it, link it together, and then they started their investigation. And when they first started Passive Total, it was hosted at DigitalOcean. You can see right here. And over here on the right-hand side, we tell you where we get the data from. If we didn't collect the data ourselves and we are using um, partners or um, we're sharing that data with others and they share their data with us, you can see who gathered that data. And over here, you can see that Alien Vault, Kapersky, and then Risk IQ. And you can see how over time, who was seeing that, that resolution because when the tree falls, if you're not there, you're not going to see it. So we're trying to get this data for, for um, DNS from all over the world all the time to give you the richest information possible. So then around um, 2016, you can see that it's at Amazon. That's the time that RiskIQ purchased Passive Total from Brandon and Steve, and now they're part of our company. So you can see when it was purchased. So you can get a little history by looking at where um, where these IP addresses were and how they were responding over time. So we can see here that it's all in the US and the first and last seen dates that we see associated with. So if we look at the WHOIS records, the WHOIS records are who's registered to this domain. And I'm going to switch to my second screen and go to my next slide so you can see this. So if we take a look here, um, um, we'll look at DNS. I'm sorry. Well, we'll look since we're staying with this. I'm sorry. We'll look at the DNS. So if we take a look at the DNS records, um, the DNS records, we didn't used to make this public, but what we're finding out is some of the threat actors would 
limit the amount of data they were showing. Um, and, and so instead of we find one bad IP address and then we go, oh, there's another domain associated with that IP, that's suspicious, oh, that domain is bad, the threat actors started to get smart. So they started to carve up their IP addresses that they were advertising to the world and say, oh, for this organization, um, I'm only gonna make it three IP addresses and, and here's the IP addresses that we're advertising. So when those got burned, there wasn't another um, IP address there that linked to, to bad infrastructure. Um, but we also wanted to find out like, oh, it's email capable. It's now part of a phishing attack. Um, other name servers. So we can look at those name servers and find all the contents inside those name servers um, and the, the, the different um, C names that were associated with that domain. So the information that we started to glean from this was very useful. So we made this available and rolled back and gave all that data back to the community so you could look at these DNS pieces to help you in understanding the threat and in the investigation. Um, so if we take a look real quick, I'll, I'll jump back to the other screen. Um, and if you look here, you can see uh, here are the mail, uh, the mail servers that we have. Uh, here's the conical name. So this will be just probably uh, passive total uh, that's here, passivetotal.org. We are looking at WW passive total, uh, the start of authority, uh, the text files. Uh, so you can start seeing um, um, all of the different DNS aspects that we have, okay? So when we look at these different records, some of these might be new to you. So uh, the mail exchange is the mail server responsible for accepting the, uh, the messages on, on re for that domain. Uh, the name server is the NS record, okay? Um, the text record um, is what we're what people use to like um, make sure that people understand it's not a it's not going to send spam um, it's the uh, the the D mark it's all those types of of records that are in there to help um, legitimize your domain and protect you from from getting bad stuff the start of authority shows that hey this is the record that for the domain that's that's going to be the um, um, the main um, system. And the conical names are like if you had passivetotal.org and then you might have a www.passivetotal.org, uh, another way of, of accessing that same domain. Okay, now subdomains um, are all of the domains that are um, like the domain dot and the domain that you're searching for. Now, the one thing that most people don't realize is that every single subdomain can have completely different infrastructure underneath it. So some threat actors might go into your um, DNS server and create a subdomain, and it looks like it's from you, but it's not linking to any of your infrastructure. So it's really important during your investigations to start looking at these subdomains as another avenue for you to completely understand uh, the investigation. So if I go back, and we're gonna look at the, the other screen real quick, um, from here, if I looked at subdomains, you can see all the different ones, api.passivetotal.org, blog.passivetotal.org, so search. So it's really important to look at these because some threat actors might use the same sort of naming conventions for subdomains that they use. And so as we go through some of these investigations, you'll, you might start seeing a, a pattern. So the TTPs that the threat actor might use and how they name things and what they're doing, or it might be a random number uh, or a encrypted, uh, a 64-bit um, encrypted value that if you took that and you put it in and decrypted it, um, you would understand what 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 it really meant. So very important for these. Okay, so I'll go back to the other screen. Okay. So the who is record. So the who is record is who um, is registered for this um, domain? Who owns it? Now, um, if you had the free account and you weren't in a trial and you didn't have a promo code, you would only see the current record. We have 10 years worth of history. So we can actually show you some, some interesting things inside of the who is records um, um, to find relationships and other things. So you can find out how old the domain is, um, what the history is, are there any fake privacy email domains? So you might see in some cases, somebody might have um, privacy protection at hotmail.com. 
Um, so they're made up. Or you might see the name of the owner of this domain is Superman or Batman. And so um, as we go through and we do some of these exercises, we can look for some of these things to find some cool things that are out there. Okay. So if we go back into the other the other screen, I'll jump back real quick. And let's take a look at the who is records and I'll show you how to get around. So we try to make this pretty easy for you. So up above, if I wanted to see all the email addresses that have been associated, I can immediately see, hey, there was some proxy, some privacy, um, and then there was some real passive total uh, emails in there. If I look at the registrars, I can see which companies held the registration. Um, and if I look at the, the name servers, I can see those, the phone numbers associated with it, the organizations. And in each one of these records, I can click on one of them, and I can go back in time and see the actual record and what we've pulled out of them. And everything in blue is, is um, we call pivotable. If you click on it, it will run that query for you. Or if you right click, um, I can now say open in another tab. So as I go through, um, we'll start to see, we might even see our CEO's name in here. Let's take a look. Uh, let's see. Yeah, Elias. So this is Lou, he's our CEO. So I could right click on this and say, open another tab. And I would see every other domain that we have records for that have been associated with, with Lou. And so risk IQ, uh, risk IO.us, he bought that one as well. And there's 30 other domains that he's been associated with. So this is the type of information that can help you looking at history inside of there. Okay, I'll go back to the other screen. Okay, so what this allows you to do is to create these infrastructure chains that we've been talking about. If I have an IP address and I click on the IP, I can see every domain that was associated with that IP address going back to when we, we started collecting data over 11 years ago. Okay, so you can get that rich history. If I look at the WHOIS data, I can look at the email addresses, the telephone numbers, uh, the organization, and I can find other domains that are associated with it. But we had GDPR, the General Data Protection Regulation, back in 2018. And what did that do? Threw a monkey wrench in our, in our jobs, made it a lot harder. And the reason for that is that you can no longer link that data together to be able to pivot and see those things because a lot of that information has been redacted. Um, so the way it works is that if you're free or paid site, if you're um, doing stuff with, with the EU, um, that information is generally private. So things on your website are private, but they started to do redactions in the who is records to just give you privacy protection. So then they know who owns the, the website and it's some number or some random thing that's that's been protected that you can't link it to something else because it's everyone is different. So it kind of ruined our um, ability to use that. So if you're in violation, it's pretty expensive. They use 4% of global revenue or 20 million euros, whichever is higher, they're gonna charge you with, okay? So it broke the relationships that we had with the WHOIS records, okay? Um, but if we look at certificates, certificates can link that data together and it might have the same type of information that we were using inside of the WHOIS record to show you those relationships. So some cool things to think about with certificates is that um, you have, um, you can see if it's self-signed, you can see who the provider was, there are organizational information in there, there's IP addresses, there's street numbers, and all these are generally pivotal. So the same sort of thing that you would do with the WHOIS record, we you can do with a certificate. Now that's an advanced data set, but we give it free to the community because we want you to be able to link these things together, and we want you to have something that kind of worked like WHOIS records, okay? Um, so if we come back to the other, machine, the other screen, okay, hold on one second. Um, and we come back up and we look at the other tab and we look at certificates, there's been 31 different certificates. 
and we can see the first and last scene. So these are some old certificates because now it's part of uh, community.riskiq.com. Okay, but if we look over time, um, we can see the organization, the alternative names, the common name, and um, generally these are pretty good at. Uh, if I search for one of these, so if I look for um, passivetotal.org, and I open that up in another tab. I can now start to see every certificate that had that in there or IP address associated with it. So I can get a lot of things linking a lot of the data together like I did with who is. So that's that's why we made that available to everybody, um, whether you're using a, a, a free email uh, or a public um, uh, or a, a free public email or an organizational email. Um, but we just limit the amount of time that you can look back. You either have 90 days for the with org or 14 days with the free, or if you have a paid account, you can go back to the beginning of time that we collected data. Okay. Um, so we'll jump back to the other slide real quick. Okay. So what does that do? So we have the passive DNS, but now I can look by the the facets inside of the certificate. I can look at the SHA uh, encrypt, uh, cryptographic key. I can look at the alternative names the IP addresses um, that are associated with it, the common names, and I can link this infrastructure together. So it kind of fixes that problem, that hole that we had um, with the WHOIS records, okay? Now, hashes. So um, when we look at hashes, it's gonna look different than what um, you have today. And the reason for that is for like hybrid analysis to see that data inside of RISC-IQ I need to go out to hybrid analysis, create a free account, and take my API key and put it inside of Risk IQ. Um, and then Emerging Threats is a um, paid service. So when you click on it, it will take you to another site to log in and you have to buy access to it. But you can take that that hash value and do a Google search or go to virus total and throw it in and generally find the same thing, find the same information. So I leave this thing on and I add some of the free ones in there to get additional information. Um, so I'll jump back, I'll show you that, but it doesn't mean that this site um, has bad stuff on there. So think of it this way, if you have a domain and you have an email gateway, and let's say that you're using um, you're using a product to, to look for malware, if it finds something and it reports it, it might've been through an email that was coming in and it never really got in, you weren't doing it, but you found it and you stopped it but that hash value will be associated with your domain. So just bear that in mind. Now, by looking at these hashes, you can usually find additional information about the tactics, techniques, procedures in different infrastructure that might not be associated um, through the infrastructure chaining process. So if you execute the malware, it might communicate to a command and control system. It might do something else, but by looking at that additional information, that can help your investigation. Uh, and link other infrastructure together. So it's really important to, to look at those. So let me jump back and then I'll show you my screen and show you things about it. So if I take a look at the hashes, there's been three hashes associated with this, a hybrid analysis, emerging threats. And if I right click and I open on these, let's see if it's still there. Okay, so here's, here's one piece that it popped up um, and it gave me some additional information. But the way that it does this, is that if I come into my profile and I look at my account settings, if I go to sources, this is where I control the different sources I want to see. So for virus total and hybrid analysis, I can add my credentials or API keys in here that when I run a query and I search for a domain or an IP address, at runtime, we will query those other sources and bring that data back and show it to you at the same time. So you don't have to leave the platform to do it but this is how you control it, it's through here, okay? So when I look at stuff, you might not have seen the hybrid analysis for passivetotal.org because you don't have it configured, okay? okay? So let's go back. And Alex, at any point, if I miss something, please keep me honest, okay? Yeah, definitely. Okay, and then the open source intelligence that we see. So if you look at that tab, that's like a, um, a paid Google search that Risk IQ does. So when you search for something, we search particular um, 
uh, websites that put out security blogs and security information to filter to look for the thing that you search for. A hash, you're searching for um, an email address, a domain, um, an IP address, and then we'll list those things there for you. Um, now, we also have our threat portal that we'll get into in a little bit that will have additional information associated with, but with that tab, you'll see our articles plus the articles from other um, places around the world, okay? But we're trying to give that to you so you can see it all in one place. And the thing to think about is that those ILCs, um, by looking at those articles, you're gonna see different ILCs or different things that you might not have seen. So you might've had one indicator internally, but by looking at those articles, you might find a lot more of that investigation. And if you look at it in the threat portal, you might find the full investigation is already done with all of the aspects of, um, uh, uncovered and given to you that you can take and immediately use in your organizations. Um, so it's really important to, um, to to look at this information. So if I went back, I, I don't have any open source intelligence associated with PassiveTotal.org, so it's empty. So we'll we'll just go to the next one for right now. So when we look at um, um, the Threat Intel Portal. Um, the Threat Intel Portal is our new interface uh, and a place for you to search. And this doesn't count against any of your query limits or anything by searching in here. Um, the cool thing about this is that I can type in something like Russia and it will tell me every article that had Russia in it. Or I can type in a hash, a domain, and any article that had any of that would show up and I would immediately see it. So it's a nice way of quickly searching through the data to find that intelligence to make it more tactical and operational. And the less, um, there's some strategic stuff in there, but you can take that information and then apply it to your organization to say, hey, are, are we affected by this a lot easier using our platform, okay? So I'll go in in a second and we'll actually do a search. But when we go through and we look, um, there'll be tags associated with it, a description of something, um, a little brief like key references like if there's anything in the article that we were uh, that came from open source we'll list them all there so you can immediately click on them and see the articles um, and then there's the risk iq intelligence and with that intelligence some of them are public indicators available to everybody in the world and other ones are are risk iq indicators that are available to the paid users where our threat intel and security researchers have gone through and um, found more infrastructure associated with that threat to give it all to you at one point in time. And you can pivot off of any of the, the, um, the IPs, domains, everything listed by just clicking on it and either going directly there or opening it up in another tab. Um, and so if you search for Russia, for example, you would see all of the domains uh, with who has registrations associated with Russia um, that we had articles on. And then down below are any of the open source intelligence that we found that's associated with it. And, and then if you wanted to switch between the threat intel portal and the classic view, in the upper right-hand corner, that's where you do that. And you can even save articles uh, in there. So let's jump hey, back over. We, yes. Can you go back to the previous slide? I just wanted to mention something else about the indicators as far as if you wanted to get those ingested into your SIM or, or SOAR, for instance. Um, right now, we've got the ability to download those as a CSV, so that little download icon right there. But on our next release, we're going to be um, allowing users to actually access the all of the information within the articles themselves as an API endpoint. And our engineers are in the process right now of creating an API endpoint just for our um, indicators themselves. So for the time being, though, you do have the ability from your account settings, like Benjamin pointed out earlier, to sign up for weekly or daily email alerts for any new articles that we do release. So that would be one way that you can stay ahead of, of what's new to come in and get that information to enrich it in your other tools. Perfect. Thank you. So yep. if, if, we, um, if we take a look here, and if I went up and clicked on the Risk IQ icon, and I click on the new PT. Now I'm in it. So if I typed in Russia, you would see that same search. And then all the articles that we have with Russian threat actors, and there's five pages of it. So if I clicked on one, um, you would see, for example, here's one where we had the description and the public indicators already in there. 
So if we looked at the original article, okay, so here's the original article. As we go through, you might see indicators in here. So let's see. Uh, execution. So you have these in here. So I would have to copy each one of these. And if you see, they're kind of, so I grab it, I copy it, and then I would have to go in to look at it inside of passive total. But what we've done is we've taken that information and here are all the public indicators. So I can come in here and say, let me see that. And as soon as I click on it, I'm off to the races. So it's going to save you a ton of time just by using it, whether you're using the enterprise indicators or just the community indicators. Just that alone will save you a tremendous amount of time. Um, so I just wanted to show you that. So when we go through some of the exercises, you'll you'll see that. Okay. Hey Benjamin, hey. can you go back to the Russia search real quick too? Sure. I just wanted to point out. I think this is also really helpful when you when you actually so from the Russia search that you had opened up earlier. There's a little tag section there. So if you're interested to research what hosts or domains might be affiliated with a particular threat actor group, if you pivot off any of these tags, like for instance, if you were to click on Waterbug or um, I can't see what snake, yeah, uh, whatever it may be, you can see all of the different hosts and domains affiliated with that threat actor group. So it also gives you the capability of being able to start out with no indicators, right? And then be able to find some indicators to begin a, a new investigation from scratch. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. And here we go. Okay, so public projects. So, uh, pub, so we have um, projects. So, with the with projects, think of them this way: um, if I make it public, it's available to everybody in the world. And so, during an investigation, I can take an indicator and save it to a, pro, a a project. And when you do that, you can put a monitor in place. And the monitor, as things change with that IP, let's say it's associated with a different domain, you would get alerted that there's a new domain associated with that IP, or vice versa. If you're searching, on, if you're monitoring a domain. If a new IP showed up for it, you would see that as well. Um, now, there's three different types of projects. Public, everybody in the world sees it. So if you're investigating a threat actor, don't make it a public project. And then you have team projects and analyst projects. So team project is everybody in your organization sees it. That's part of your organization. And an analyst project is private just to you. And inside of the project, you can add collaborators. And that could be somebody in your organization or somebody outside of your organization that has a passive total account. So if you're sharing information with another group or another friend at a different company, you can add them to the project and you would see that project information together. Okay. So just bear that in mind that you have that ability to do that. Okay. And then so all these things allow you to, to, to infrastructure chain more things together. And the way that this works is because of the virtual users. So I'm going to go through and quickly explain how this works and, and what we do. So as this virtual user stuff goes out and gathers all this data as a real user, the important thing to think about is um, what do we see in a web page? How do we get that data across? So if we looked at passivetotal.org, okay, and we crawled that, you would see the response. So this is pictures from our backend system where we gather this data and it starts building our data sets. So we see the response in here, and this might show like the cookie, it might show some of the tag information inside of here. Um, we get the links. So this is how we know how things are interconnected one way. Um, we'll look at the dependent requests. So for example, when we crawled this, we went to passivetotal.org, but then it got redirected to HTTPS passivetotal.org. And then there was a special font that we like to use on our website, which was um, listed here as a JavaScript. So we see all those things that are associated with it. And then we have the cookies. So we use AWS and Woopra. So we have those cookies associated with it. Um, and then we have the certificate. So we have from every place that we've gone for, for oh, about 10 years, we have all the certificates. So if that certificate is now seen someplace else. We can show you that relationship. We can show you all that, like um, the information about what's stored in it. And we talked about that earlier. Now we operationalize this crawl data. So the certificates, free community accounts that are uh, individual ones, 14 day visibility, 90 days for professionals and enterprise have full access to those certificates. Uh, the trackers, 
host pairs, web components, cookies, and services. So when you look at the trackers, the trackers are the little bits of code that we use um, to be able to see the user experience. So think of like the analytic codes like your marketing department uses, that if your website got duplicated, they would know, the marketing department would know, but you wouldn't know because you separation of duties, you don't see that. But with Risk IQ, I can search for those codes and find every other website in the world that might be using my own codes and find bad infrastructure. And we're gonna go through and do that in just a minute. Uh, but I wanna go through and, and, and show these things to you. And then I'm gonna turn this over to Alex so Alex can go through and we can do this use case. So as we look at the trackers, we can see um, um, from the document object model, we pull up the tracker, we can see every domain that's associated with it, with the certificates, uh, how those are related to other IPs and domains. Now the host pairs, um, are the relationship of the parent child. So like you might be reaching in and grabbing a JavaScript file from another site or sending analytics out to Google. So you can see those relationships. If something was a script, an image, um, if there was a, a CSS uh, import happening, you'll be able to see all those and the redirects. So it's really, it's like the map of the internet by looking at all those. So from that, we see the links, the, the sequence data, the dependent requests, host pairs, and we link all that information out to show you how those relationships uh, are out there and what's happening with the flow of data. So with the web components, um, if you look at a legitimate um, domain, they might have hundreds of web components listed. Uh, but when you look at a threat actor, the threat actor might have just a few, because the threat actor doesn't want to stand up infrastructure uh, that they don't have to use or pay for. So that could be something suspicious if you only see a couple things um, running there. So as we go through uh, the use case, things to think about are um, if some piece of code was marked as malicious or not, or if there's a vulnerability associated with a web component because it's PHP version five, um, or if it's a rare um, component because if the threat actor created something unique, we might have pulled that out and made it its own web component to say, if you see this, we know it's bad. Um, and then any libraries that are being used or things like that. So for the pen testers, this is really important to look at. Now the cookies um, are really good at finding relationships as well. And sometimes those unique cookies um, are great. So like, for example, there's been some threat actors that would, instead of a, a a PHP session ID, they might have misspelled it to be PNP session ID, so it doesn't get overridden. So by looking at some of these cookies, you can illuminate those in that infrastructure. And we're gonna go through and, and look at look at a good and a bad. The services tab um, is only showing uh, 14 days of data right now. We have data going back to the beginning of time, but right now it's only showing 14 days um, we've made requests to make that a data available by the heat map to show particular periods of time. Um, so hopefully in the next few months that will be available to everybody. But the cool thing about this is that you might find something in the banner that's specific to a threat actor or a misspelling or something that when you see that on another site and you find that little piece inside of the services um, tab, you'll be able to say, yes, it is bad by seeing that uniqueness in there. So it's really cool to see it. And then you might even be able to, to look at your investigation and say, this IP address has been up for five years, but it's a Windows server and it has RDP enabled and there's a, a creation date. So I know when the server was brought up. So I know the date that the server was brought online. So there's some cool information that you can get out of it that we'll, we'll see when we go through the investigation. Uh, and then we also have a CrowdStrike tab. So inside of CrowdStrike, you can enable an application, Illuminate for Risk IQ, that when you search for something in, in Risk IQ, we'll search the CrowdStrike instance and bring that internal data of people that have touched those things that you search for and bring it into the interface. And then you can take information from Risk IQ and send it back to CrowdStrike to find new detections and, and new alerts, okay? And we have other um, threat any workshops where we actually went through and do complete use cases for that. And then if I looked at an IP address, I can see the reverse DNS listed with it. And so with that, I'm gonna turn it back over to Alex after I show you a quick little um, um, video. 
um, and I'll talk through it to show you what you're up against um, with threat actors real quick. So this is an anatomy of a, a phishing attack. So give me a second. Can everybody see it okay? Yep. Okay. So um, the reason why I'm showing you this is because um, about a year ago, I went through and I, I used this software called Goldfish to see um, how easy it would be to create a phishing attack. So I'm going to demonstrate a spear phishing attack because I'm a spear fisherman and I want to show how easy this could be. So what the threat actor does is they determine who they're going to attack. So for example, we're going to attack Benjamin who works for Risk IQ and I have his email address. So this is live, like I recorded myself doing this and it's really easy for this for for threat actors to stand up this infrastructure. So they create a uh, an email address list and they put, for example, my email in there. And then what they do is they take a legitimate email. So they want to take my Fortinet credentials. Okay. So this was back in 2017. I did this. So I took a real email, and you and then you also want to find out where you want to get into. In this case, they're going to get into my Fortinet account. So they find out the support login page, okay? So now that I have who I want to attack and the email I'm going to send and the URL, I can now create an email template. And this is how easy it is. So to create the email template, I name it. And then I go and view the source of the email and I copy it. So I copy the whole thing. And then I paste it in. I import it in. Here it goes. I paste it. And then I tell it to change the links to be my landing page. So it automatically will change all the links. Okay. Okay. So that, that email piece is done. So now I'm going to create the landing page where I'm going to steal the credentials from. So I copy the URL. And then I go and I tell it, create a landing page. And I paste it in. Now I'll import this, the URL in just a second. So I import it in. And then I tell it to capture the data. And because it's the pen testing tool, it tells you, hey, the, the credentials aren't stored encrypted. So, And then I can tell it to go to the real website once you type in the credentials to log you into the real website so you don't really know. So I paste that original website in there. So it's going to capture my credentials and the passwords, and it's going to log me into the real website so the person won't know. Okay. So the next thing is you're going to create your campaign. It's just like a marketing campaign. So you go in and you start the campaign. Okay, so you name it. And now in this particular case, I did it internally in my lab, but I could have had a public IP, got a free certificate and made it look legitimate. And then I pick how I'm gonna be sending it and I get my email list and I launch the campaign. Now, once I launch the campaign, you'll see in a second, it's going to create the campaign, the email sent, when it was received, when it was opened. So it's sending. Okay. And then in a second, you'll notice on the bottom part of the screen that it's been sent. Okay. So now all I have to do is I have to open the email. Okay. So the email's been sent. Okay. So here's the email. So now I'm going to click in and register. So I can log into the my support. So I click on it and it says log in. So if you notice in the upper left, it's the wrong place and it's not even HTTPS because I didn't set that up. But once I log in, look what happens. So I'm going to type the password, okay, and then pay attention to the upper left. When I hit log in, look, it's been secured and it's the real website. But it didn't take the first time, so I'm going to hit log in again. So I hit log in one more time. And now I'm logged into the real site and I'm in. So your credentials were stolen and you didn't even know it got stolen. You just thought, oh, I clicked on it. It didn't take, I'm going to click a second time. So now I can go back in and I can replay the credentials and log directly in. Okay. Or I can view the credentials directly from the interface. Okay. So now I can view the details as well and view those credentials. Okay. So now this is what you're up against out there in the real world with these phishing attacks when they say like phishing or spear phishing. So now Alex is going to walk us through 
an entire investigation that goes through that. Okay. So, Alex, do you want to take over and make yourself presenter, or do you want me to make you presenter? I can make myself presenter. That's fine. Okay. Thanks. You're welcome. All right, so I'm going to drop the good infrastructure in the chat. These are the domains that we're going to take a look at that are good infrastructure. Um, actually, all right. Okay, so these are the ones I just dropped in the chat, and then we're later gonna take a look at the bad infrastructure. So there's gonna be some leads that we'll find from the tracker ID um, that paypal.com used that some foreign infrastructure had. So uh, when we get to that piece, I will send you the links to those as well. All right, so taking a look at paypal.com, we're just gonna walk through all the different data sets and see how you know this appears to be a legitimate domain. So when we first look at this, we can see that overall there's a lot of infrastructure that we're looking at, right? Um, it also dates back, well, when we first recognized the domain since we were founded in 2009, all the way back to 2009. Um, we can also see that they're using a reputable registrar, Mark Monitor. We can also see from the the locations here that they're all us based locations there's been consistencies with the asn over time it's affiliated with paypal um, there was one hiccup here but overall you can see that the majority of the asn is is paypal inc um, we can also see from our who is information again that they're using mark monitor um, that it's affiliated with paypal inc um, out of San Jose, California, et cetera. So overall, everything that I'm seeing here appears to be a legitimate site. And then if we were to do a pivot off of the phone number, we could find all of the other domains uh, that share the same phone number in their Whois record. Same thing with the name servers that we saw from the Whois record before. Here we can see all the different domains that share the same name server in their Whois record. And then if we take a look at the certificates, we can see that they're using a reputable organization to create their certificates, DigiCert. So the certificates also can kind of tell us that this, hey, this might be a reputable organization. And another thing that we can find here too is that it's an Alexa top um, 10K domain, which just indicates that this is one of the top most visited sites out there on the web. So usually sites like this are not malicious in nature. And, and the sheer number of of alternative names and IP addresses that you'll see uh, associated with a certificate, it's, it's extremely large. Yep, exactly. Thanks, Benjamin. You're welcome. And then from the subdomains, we can see that there's a lot of different PayPal um, domains that are affiliated with, with the, the main domain that we searched against. And then if we take a look at the trackers, this is the tracker value that we'll go ahead and pivot off of and see if there's any domains that appear to be foreign, not affiliated with paypal.com. So as we can see, if we pivot off of the Google Analytics tracking ID, there's some recent um, domains that we've observed um, that are still either recently seen, it looks like. Um, hey, so uh, this diamond. Can you show how, how you did that pivot? Can yeah. you go yeah, back yeah. into the so yep. you right click, show them that. Yeah, so you can either right click, open it up in a new tab. If you're using a Mac, command click, or you can click in it directly. Either way, that will open you up into a new um, into searching for that. Thank you. So, so these are the domains that we're going to take a look at today. Um, all the ones that we've seen as of July. We could spend our wheels and, and go through all of those, but. Um, those are the ones that we'll we'll focus on today. And Benjamin, do you do you mind um, actually sending that in the chat? I can. Sure. Give me one I second. Can, yeah. 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 I need to grab it. I don't have it open right now, so one second. Okay. Or just can you copy it and paste it into the chat? Yeah. Yeah. Let's do that. Yeah. Um,
Okay, just got it. Perfect. Okay. So we're going to focus on the dynas.ac.id all the way down to the www.ocwoc domains. All right, so let's finish looking through the rest of the paypal.com data sets. So here we can see from components, just from the sheer volume of components that's, um, that's affiliated with PayPal tells us that more than likely this is also a legitimate site. Um, normally threat actors aren't gonna spin their wheels, especially if their domains could be taken down at any moment to create a bunch of components. So um, this is also a good indication that this is probably legitimate piece of organization's infrastructure. And then if we take a look at host pairs, we can see the relationships between PayPal um, and other child host names, et cetera. So um, some of these are legitimate organizations if they're not just from a visual perspective affiliated with PayPal. Maybe they're using um, the PayPal.com plugin to actually allow their users to pay with PayPal.com on the site. But some of them might be phishing sites, which we'll, we'll go into here in a bit, um, that are stealing PayPal.com's information to appear to be affiliated with PayPal. And then from our OSINT tab, we can see um, anything that's affiliated with PayPal.com from our, our parser that looks for Google search results related to PayPal.com in this case. Um, but what's interesting is that there's a Krebson security article. So I went ahead and took a look at that. And it's an article just about how all of these different entities have hackers that are, are, are getting in and, and stealing users' credentials. So kind of like what Benjamin was just describing on, on how he was able to go and fish himself, essentially the same thing, but then they're selling those credentials on the black market um, so that <clears throat> other, other users out there can be able to go and, and buy goods through those specific users' login credentials. And then, of course, hashes, just a way to see if the domain's affiliated with any malware. And then here's all of the DNS records that are more than just the A records affiliated with PayPal.com. So one thing to take note of is this hostmaster at PayPal.com, the start of authority. We're going to see the same record being used later when we take a look at PayPalobjects.com. And then cookies, as he mentioned before, this is where the cookie value originated from, from the domain, um, and then the host names that also observe the same cookie values. So if we wanted to, we could spend some time and look through all of these to see if any of these host names appear to be foreign and not affiliated with PayPal, um, just to broaden our investigation. So going back to trackers, now we're going to start taking a look at the known bad. So let's first take a look at this dynas.ac.id. So if you right click and open another tab, you'll be able to, to see that easily. Um, so you can go back to the list if we need to. Yeah. Okay, thanks. So as we take a look here, what I'm seeing is that there's different countries of origin that the domain is resolving to the IPs compared to the paypal.com. So that stands out to me. I'm also seeing a lot of changes in the ASN over time, as you can see. Some of them overlap, but um, a lot of these here there's a lot of changes along the way that you can see. And then if you want to details about the ASN, we've got those in the system tags or just from hovering over the ASN itself. We can also see from Analyst Insights that it was blacklisted three days ago. So that's also probably a good indication that it's not affiliated with PayPal. And then if we take a look at the Whois record, we're not seeing the same registrar being used, Mark Monitor. So paypal.com and paypalobjects.com both use Mark Monitor, and plus you can't see a lot of the, the history, like everything else has been redacted for privacy as well. Um, and they're not using the same name servers in their Whois record either. And then if we take a look at the subdomains, um, nothing is affiliated with PayPal, it looks like, from that aspect. But one thing that's important to take note here is a lot of times threat actors if they go and scrape source code from a legitimate company organization, sometimes they'll try to execute their phishing campaigns from subdomains that they spin up too. So it's not enough just to look at the domain itself. It's also important 
to dig in and, and do further analysis against all of the different subdomains. So just to take a look at that, for instance, if we did a pivot off of this first one here, this alumni.dynas.ac.id, we could see, you know, this was just recently registered um, as of July 14th, whereas this domain before has been around since 2009. And you can see some common trends here too, like the who is record is the same, um, all the details, I mean, from the who is record is the same as the other domain. And then if we take a look at the components and filter by the tracking pixel, we can see that they've, since they scraped the source code from PayPal, we're able to surface up the tracking pixel as a category and show that they're stealing information um, or the tracking pixel is affiliated rather from PayPal advertising. And then if we take a look at the host pair relationships, we're gonna see that dynas.ac.id is reaching out to www.paypalobjects.com. So a few different causes with that. We can see that they're pulling in the style sheets from paypalobjects.com. And here it's always important to take note of like when it was first and last seen. So if you ever wanted to leverage a, a tool like URL scan.io, you can go back in time to understand which um, you know, previous snapshot you'd want to look at um, for when they actually executed their campaign. Because as you know, phishing campaigns, um, usually they're recognized in a, a matter of a couple of days by the, you know, the time the domain's actually taken down. Can I, can I say one thing real quick? Can, can you go mm -hmm. back to those pairs? So if you take a look and if you, if you look at the child host name and the parent host name, so if the child host name is the PayPal site, so if you choose the child host name is the PayPal one, it will be Which the PayPal. Surface yeah, so but just, just from looking on the, 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 the screen right there, so what happens is the the Dynas is reaching out to PayPal objects to bring that data back. So um, it's it's the thing where it's trying to like uh, you log in correctly, but it's going to steal your credentials. That's kind of what's happening there. So with those those objects, you're seeing you're going to see the relationship where the parent is reaching to the child to to either um, uh, take something from there or put something there. That's the the relationship of of what you will see with these these phishing attacks is that the parent is is reaching out to the child, which is the real site that um, they're doing the the bad stuff on. Thanks, Benjamin. So yeah, and if we take a look at the DNS record, we're not seeing the same start of authority record being used as PayPal.com. Um, so that's that's also just something to take note of, but. In general, if you wanted to broad, broaden your investigation, a lot of times threat actors, the same threat actor group will re reuse the same name servers to segment their infrastructure or the same MX mail exchange servers to administer their command and control channel. So just common trends to look out for. And then if we take a look at the cookies, um, we can see that uh, if I just do a quick search here for paypal.com, that they've um, when they went ahead and, and scraped the source code from, from PayPal, they were able to ingest those cookie values as well. So we're able to observe a lot of this, the cookie value names that originated from PayPal.com servers that are being observed on this domain here. So we could go through and do pivots off of each of these cookie values to see what other um, host names share the same the cookie value names. And then just to give you guys a historical screenshot from when we did this crawl, um, this was executed on September 17th, and this is what the site looks like. So again, just kind of going back to those host pair relationships, being able to pull in the style sheets, the images, all that stuff, that's how they're able to emulate exactly what paypal.com or PayPal objects looks like, right? Hey, do you, do you mind if I show, um a URL scan just to show them how that piece works. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. that's fine. Okay, so um, I'm going to make my I'm going to make myself presenter just for a second.
so you can see this. Make presenter. Okay. So if you take a look at this, I want it to URL scan IO and I search for that domain. And if you notice, there's a few that are listed here. And if I did a, I, I went up the way that I did this, I'll show you real quick. So instead of running the search from here where it actually goes out right now and scans it, I went to the uh, search. And from here, I search for this to bring this up. And the reason why I'm showing you this is to show you how you can get the image to see what's happening. So if I look at one of these old ones and I look at it, um, I can see, hey, here's PayPal. So this is how it looked like, and it was this is uh, Spanish. So you can immediately see how it looked like. It's phishing, it's malicious. So you can see that information. Okay. So that's why we gave you those those different um, URLs in the very beginning. And if you looked at the transparency report from Google to see, hey, is this safe, is it safe or not? The main domain is, but um, one of the pages below it is the phishing attack. Um, so that's how you can you can see those. Okay, Alex, sorry about that. I'm gonna make you presenter. I think I'm good. I, I beat you to it, so perfect. So this was another domain that we also took a look at that shared the same tracker, um, Google Analytics ID as paypal.com. So again, we're seeing some common trends here. Again, it's been blacklisted. Um, it's not an Alexa 100K domain. Um, there's changes in the ASN provider over time. We can see that they're not all US-based uh, locations for the PDNS resolution history. If we take a look at the who is, we can see again, they're not using Mark Monitor. Um, and it seems to be, you know, there's different names too for um, on the who is record as well. And then if we take a look, we, we're seeing that they're leveraging Let's Encrypt. And as Benjamin pointed out previously, it doesn't always mean that a threat actor um, is present, but a lot of times threat actors will leverage that just because it's a free service to create SSL certificates. So especially with phishing campaigns where the domain's gonna be taken down in a matter of days, it doesn't make sense for them to actually leverage a, a, a paid service to create those SSL certs. So these are two points of proof showing that, hey, there's something malicious or suspicious. So we have a bad who is information. The Let's Encrypt is free. So that's another suspicious that as you start adding these things up. And then if we take a look at um, components again, we're gonna see the same thing like we saw before where they have a tracker that ties back to PayPal advertising. And then if we take a look at the host pairs, again, we're gonna see the same patterns here. They're reaching out to paypalobjects.com to be able to pull in the CSS, different scripts, et cetera. And you can see that this domain too was also added to our phishing um, as well as our, our blacklist list. And then if we take a look at the OSINT, we're gonna see that there's an article here on Pastebin. So I went ahead and took a look at that. And for those of you that aren't uh, familiar with Pastebin, it's just a whole repository of any stolen data out there on the internet. So this tells me that um, there's been stolen data affiliated with, with this domain or this domain is stolen data out there. Again, this is hashes where we can see if the domain's affiliated with any malware. And again, there's uh, they're not using the same SOA record as um, paypal.com is using. And then if we take a look at cookies, again, we're seeing the same things. They're taking cookie values that originated from paypal.com or paypalobjects.com. So I went ahead and um, opened up all of these cookies from the cookie search. And again, this is another one of our crawls. So we performed this on 12-21-2019. And I may have forgot to point out before, but uh, again, I, I was able to infer when to actually go back and, and look for the crawl information based on when I saw that first host pair relationship being seen where they pulled in like the CSS or um, images from paypalobjects.com. So again, this is what we observed when we went out and crawled that site during that time. So this was another known bad uh, domain that shared the same tracker value. 
um, just to speed things up a little bit. Again, I'm seeing a lot of the same trends like I saw before, changes in the ASN over time, different locations for the PDNS resolution history, um, different information in the who is record. And if I take a look at components, again, they're using the same tracking pixel um, or they've captured the same tracker from that dates back or relates back to PayPal advertising. And if I take a look at host pairs, again, I'm seeing the same things uh, where this domain's calling out to PayPal objects for the same type of information. And again, if I look at DNS, they're also using a different start of authority record than PayPal. And then cookies, again, same things where they're where they're they have captured the same cookie values as PayPal objects or PayPal.com. So Alex, when you get done with this particular domain. Then I'll take over and I'll show the um, the sources because we only have five minutes left. Okay, perfect. Thanks. All right. So um, so yeah, this was also where we performed the call crawl and we found that it related back to a fish. Um, the only thing I was going to point out real quick, Benjamin, before you go, was I wanted to show how uh, let me find it here. Just the comparison between PayPal objects and PayPal.com. Okay, so here's here's a good example. So PayPalobjects.com. If we take a look at the SOA record, it's the same SOA record being used as PayPal.com. And then also, if we take a look at the Who Is information for PayPal objects, um, we can see that they're also using Mark Monitor and they have a lot of the same contact or same information in their Whois record as PayPal.com. So I'll leave you with that and I'll um, change you to presenter, Benjamin. Okay, great. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Oops. Actually, I'll let you change yourself. I'm okay. not. I, I'm sharing my screen now. So I just put into the chat message a way for you to find all the Windows remote desktops. And the reason why I'm showing this is recently I did a um, I did a workshop for Microsoft. It was their their prime unit, and they brought something to my attention that I never noticed. That was pretty cool. So when we look at all these IP addresses, there's over um, 9 million um, IP addresses with Windows Remote Desktop. These are accessible from the internet. Okay. So hey Benjamin, if, I'm not I'm not seeing your screen. Okay, give me a second. Stop sharing. Make presenter. Show my screen. Do you see it now? Yep. Thanks. Okay. Thank you, thank you. So if we take a look at this um, search I did, I looked for a component that was associated with Windows Remote Desktop. Now, uh, nothing showed up on the host, but if you clicked on the IPs, you see we almost have 10 million IP addresses here. If I click on one of these, I'm just gonna click on the first one. So as soon as I run that, we get the, the cookie of showing uh, the breadcrumb. So if we need to go back, I can click on it and go back, or I can hit the back key. And if I go to services um, and we take a look down below, we'll see this Windows Remote Desktop section. And for the pen testers, this is the cool pieces that that would be nice for you to have. So you have this issue date, and I and the thing that was pointed out to me that I didn't really think about was, you know, you might have a domain that's been around for a long time, um, but this machine might be new that was responding on that IP or domain. And this machine was created June 9th. So you can actually see when it was created. Now, the other thing is there's you're leaking some information out. So this is the actual machine name that was associated with this as well. So it gives me the capability of understanding that information and to be able to leverage that in my investigations. Now, you could do these with other aspects as well, but this is one of the ones I wanted to show you. And you can get that from going to any of the um, components that are listed here. So if we go to components, I'll show you real quick. Um, my machine is frozen right now. Let's see. 
Let me refresh. I've got the components. So if I see things listed here, if I select them, um, I will now run a search and show me everywhere in the world where that is seen. And so here there's over 2 million with SMB remote access enabled. Um, so you can actually run queries and find everywhere in the world something's running. And this is why the services are so important to um, only give to the security professionals because there might be a vulnerability or something in one of these um, banners that you that might tie something to something uh, bad. So if we take a look inside of here, you can actually see the responses that we we got, and you can you can see all the information that we're seeing. So this is the type of thing that um, we have available to all of the the users. And as long as you're using an organization um, email, uh, it's available to the community that you can go in and you can see this and you can leverage it in your investigation. So if you're a pen tester, before even touching the box and going out to a site, you can have this information to know what is there uh, without probing them. So that's a way of to do your engagement and be a little more stealthy before you begin and before they know that you're probing them. So you can leverage this information. So Barrett and Jacqueline, are there any um, questions that came up that we need to answer before we end? Yeah, Benjamin, I know we're right at time, but there was a question from several different people uh, okay. asking about integrations and if, sure. you know, where can we leverage this information, you know, whether it be a SIM or SOAR, uh, can you speak a little bit about integrations before we wrap up? Sure, so um, we have, Tons of integrations associated with um, passive total. So uh, we have integrations with Splunk, um, with CrowdStrike, and others. Um, so we can you can leverage that information uh, from our website. You can see exactly um, all of the um, the different ones that we have, we have uh, connections with. But the one nice thing that we're doing with a lot of our integrations is, for example, Splunk. Um, we have an app that runs inside Splunk where you can actually do all of the functionality inside of Passive Total and Splunk and get those hits on that internal data that that um, commingles. Like if you search for a domain, you can see everybody internally that hit those domains. Same for CrowdStrike. Um, but the nice thing is you can take the data from Risk IQ from like, for example, a project or an article and take that data back into those integrations to find new detections and make your incident response and your investigation, your threat hunting, uh, more productive, uh, leveraging that internal external data to give you, we call it 360 degree visibility. Uh, because we have all the data on the outside, you have the data on the inside and we merge them together. So then um, once you find that indicator, you can find more information with Risk IQ and bring it back in to see if anybody else um, accessed those places. Perfect, thanks Benjamin. No problem. Well that's all the time we have for questions today. We'll follow up directly with those of you who asked questions we weren't able to get to live. You can also always reach out to success at riskiq.net with additional questions. Thank you to Benjamin and Alexandra for a great workshop. And thank you to Jacqueline for supporting as well. And finally, thank you all for attending. Have a great rest of your day.